if you would stand with us uh, in reverence to the reading of the infallible Word of God. Psalms chapter 78, we're going to begin reading with verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, showing to generation uh, to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare to them, uh, declare them to their children, that they might send their hope in God, uh, that they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. You may be seated. A simple thought uh, this morning, and uh, as we're getting close to uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day, uh, we uh, think about family, and we think about, uh, and I'm going to have to get rid of this coat, it's a little warm up here. We think about family, and uh, we think about uh, a lot about honoring our mother and our father. <laughs> but uh, I wonder how many times mother and father stop to think about the children. We need to honor them too. But I want to talk to you just a little bit about a parent's responsibility. A parent's responsibility. Now, the writer here, uh, as he began to exhort this word, he uh, kind of laid, laid it on us. And he, the first thing he said here was, give ear, or listen to what I have to say to you. You know, there's uh, 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 a lot of times I believe that uh, and you bear with me for just a minute and we'll get into the message in just a second. There's a lot of times uh, 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 when we get up to preach the Word of God and the man of God gets up to preach the Word of God, and, uh, we, uh, uh, we say we're listening and we're giving ear, but are we really hearing what God's Word has to say to us? Or are we just letting it kind of go over our heads? But I want you to listen today to what I've got to say to you and I believe that if you will, it'll do you some good, especially the parents uh, that are here today. Uh, and I wish our, uh, uh, more of our younger parents were here so they could hear this today. But uh, it's a parent's responsibility, number one, to teach them God's Word. You know, in this day and time that we're living in today, I believe that our children ought to be well equipped for what lays out there in front of them. Now, most of our parents, they're going to see to it that their children have a good education. They're going to see to it that there's money put up if possible for them to go to college. Or they gonna if they're good in sports, they're gonna get them in those sports, and they're gonna uh, see to it that they uh, that they take part in those sports so that maybe they can get a scholarship, or if they uh, they're gonna do everything they can to get the very best education for their children that they can. Is that wrong? No. That's what you should do as parents. We all know that the better the education, the better chance they have in life. We know that. But we also need to educate our children about God. 
And that's the most important education that our children can get is to teach them about God. Amen. But we won't even get them and take them to Sunday school. Come on. Do good to drag in at the 11th hour. And then wonder why our children are going to drugs and to alcohol and to ex uh, uh, to sex outside the marriage and all these problems that we're having in schools and uh, on our streets today, it all goes back to have our children been taught what is right and what is wrong. Have they been taught the Word of God? I, I hear the psalmist said, we need to teach our children the law of God. We need to teach them what God is all about. What God intends, the creator that created us, what he intends our life to be. Amen, man. <laughs> we won't teach them that. We'd rather teach them how to throw a football. Come on. Or how to throw a baseball. Come on. Or how to ride a four-wheeler. Or how to ski. Or how to swim. Or how to do all these things. But it ain't important to get them in the house of God anymore. <coughs> what has gotten wrong with America? We want to sit around and we blame all of our problems on Washington. Come on. Washington didn't create the problems that we have in America today. Mamas and daddies created those problems. When they quit having family devotion, when they quit teaching their children how, how to love God and how to love one another, when they quit how, how setting them down and telling them the importance of a godly life, how, brother, that's when problems began in our homes and then it transferred, transferred from the home then to every other facet of that child's life. Amen. This isn't popular preaching, but it's the truth. Amen. And whether you'll have it or not, we're all guilty. Amen. Right. <clears throat> when did we become so busy in our life in America that we forgot the importance of giving reverence to God? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we as Judea Christians, we celebrate or we reverence God or we worship Him on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, because uh, we have been taught that that was the day that Christ rose from the dead. It was on the first day of the week. We have our traditions and all these things that we follow. But somewhere down the line, it's lost its importance. Right. Amen. I want you to let that just sink in for just a minute. <clears throat> I remember as a lad growing up, our parents before us, before my generation, they realized the importance of teaching their children about God. We didn't go to bed at night until we gathered around the family altar. The first one that I ever heard read the Word of God wasn't a Sunday school teacher. It was my dad. And then I remember that precious Sunday school teacher that we had that uh, Miss Thelma Sweat taught us in Sunday school. She had set us down. And back then, you know, they, they called it the card class. Because our Sunday school was, was on, a, on a card back then. The, the, I'm talking about the beginners, the little bitty fellows. <laughs> had a card. That's, that's called the card class. And she would take that little card and she would sit down with that little card and then she would take the word of God and she would open it up and, and she would <coughs> teach it and she would bring it down on our level to where we could understand. And we were taught lessons about uh, Moses in the bull rush, you know. <laughs> uh, I still remember those. 
It left an impression on me. I, did I always live that? No. When I got older, I was like a lot of other teenagers. Man, I, uh, I got out there in the world and I got to doing all those crazy things that every other kid was doing. But I never got away from that teaching. And I'd be in places that I shouldn't be. And I'd hear it ringing in my ears, that teaching that my mom and my dad taught me. See, Dad didn't think it was the responsibility of the pastor of the church to teach his child. Come on. He thought it was his responsibility. He didn't think it was the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. He thought it was his responsibility. But he also thought that Sunday school was important. So he got up. And he took us to Sunday school. So, uh, I'll get off of that. But I, I want it to sink in. That it was important. And it's a parent's responsibility to teach them God's word. It's a parent's responsibility to teach them how to praise God. <laughs> I hear Susie in there in the shower. She don't sing much at church, but she's getting that shower, boy, she go to sing, you know. And sometimes I'll just sit and listen to her. Now. But I thank God I've got a wife that can praise God in the shower. Amen. My children heard that a year's as raised, because she's always done it. She didn't just start it today, but she's always sung, and she don't sing rock songs, neither. <laughs> she sings them old songs of sound. But it's our responsibility as parents to teach them by example to praise God. You know, in this world that we're living in today, we get up in the morning, and most of us, before we get that first cup of coffee, but not say nothing, because <laughs> we're so stressed out from all the things that's going on around us, and we've laid there and they've rolled in our head all night long and we couldn't sleep very well. And so when we get up in the morning, we're tired to start with and grumpy and grouchy. But you know, we ought to get up praising God for, for giving us another day to serve Amen. Amen. I've told you many times about L.D. Dixon, the little bluebird that sat on his stoop and convicted old brother L.D. He said, uh, I said, that little bird would get up singing. I said, hey, every morning he'd wake him up singing out there on his windowsill. I said, one day he said, God, I'm going to stay on my knees till I can get up singing like that bird on, <laughs> in the morning. But you just think about it, the creation of God. You, you, uh, this morning I was sitting there uh, drinking a cup of coffee and looking out over the, uh, out the patio and this, uh, Susan and had, uh, had planted some uh, or sowed some winter rice seed out there, and them little birds are really enjoying that rice. <laughs> but I saw them out there this morning, and they was just a whistling and they was a singing, you know. And I thought, yeah, all the creation praises God except man when they get up in the morning. The smallest, one of the smallest things that God created, a little old sparrow about that long sitting there just praising God this morning, eating them seed that God <laughs> provided through Susan for him. And he was just the same. He was happy as he could be. God had provided for him another day. God provides for us when we don't even think about it. Right. Right. Amen. We'd be riding down the road and uh, the other day when it come all that ice and stuff, Hunter had uh, come to the house, but he had to get back home so he could go to work. So I had to take him home. I carried him down to down here to Irondale, as a matter of fact, right down here at McDonald's to meet his mother. By the time I got to Pale City, it was already sleeping. 
my windshield wipers the, couldn't keep the ice off the windshield. And I had the, uh, I had the defroster going uh, just as high as it'd go when it was still, and that ice was still sticking in spots on the windshield. Hunter said, oh, granddaddy, you need to turn around and go back. You're going to get us killed. <laughs> and I said, no, you got to go to work, boy. I know. But anyway, I, I, I went on, and I dropped him off. And when I started back, I think it scared him because he, he come over to the window and he, he said, I love you, granddaddy. Please be careful going home. So I started out. Now here's the point. Right behind me, they had a bad wreck. I mean, I had just come through there. But God had mercy and he let me get through all of that. I didn't realize until the next morning the kind of mercy that God had showed me that day I could have been in that wreck. That's right. Amen. But God allowed me and he gave me traveling mercy Amen. and I made it home because of that. Amen. We don't even realize the things that we ought to be praising God about and then we sit around and we don't even teach our children how to praise God. We ought to have them in the choir on Sunday morning. They ought to be sitting up here singing and, and praising God. They ought to see us lifting our hand and, and praising God for the God that He is and for being who He is. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. I won't tell you this, and it's probably going to make you mad. But you ain't much of a parent if you won't do that. You need to teach your children how to praise God. You need to tell them of God's strength. You see, there's times in all of our life when we become weak. And the, uh, uh, the great apostle Paul said, In my weakness is his strength made perfect. Amen. See, when I'm in times of weakness in my life, that's when I realize how strong the God that I serve really is. Amen. And we ought to be teaching our children the strength of God. There is a strength that you can reach and grab when you're out of strength. When there's nothing else that you can do when you can't go on. There is a strength that you can grab hold to that'll get you through this world. There's a strength when the other kids are sticking needles in their arms. There's a strength that'll help you to avoid doing that. When the others are turning bottles of alcohol up, there's a strength that'll help you escape that. I'm telling you, there's a strength in God that we ought to be teaching our children. See, the Israelites, they remembered how God had sustained them out there in the wilderness 40 years. How he supplied every need that they had. He fed them manna. Then when they got tired of the manna, he sent quail. He let them drink from the rock. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. God sustained them and it was His strength. And they realized that it was His strength that carried them through uh, Sinai. It was His strength that carried them into a land that they could inhabit. Amen. Then we need to remind them of the wonderful works of God. You know, it's always amazed me how that God like Lynn's miracle that she had. It's always amazed me that how at times when everybody else has give up hope and we just exercise that little old bit of faith that God give us <coughs> how mighty works 
he does. Amen. You know, I thought about you, Sharon, when I was studying for this message. And I thought about the night that God spoke to me. And them doctors had told Cheryl that she had a mass. They were just sure it was malignant. But God woke me up in the night and spoke to me. Showed me in a dream how that he would take care of Cheryl in that situation. Man, I was excited when I got to the hospital the next morning. I said, Kim, God, God told me he's going to heal Cheryl. I told him, I said, now don't y'all say anything about it. When it's time, then we'll tell the church. We didn't even say anything about it to the church, did we, for a long time. But we went in there and had prayer. When the doctor went in, they met old Ken in the hall, and they said, Mr. Kenningsworth, we don't know what to say. We know that mask was there. Isn't that what they told you, Ken? Amen. But when we got in there, there wasn't nothing there. Amen. It was gone. Amen. They wasn't even a tumor. There wasn't nothing there. All of it gone. Amen. Say, so, well, preacher, it's probably just a spot on the x-ray. No. That tumor was there to start with. But God took care of it. What mighty works God's displayed here. Yeah. for us yeah. not just here I've seen it over the years uh, Sister Aileen Wallace I love Sister Aileen with all my heart she does me and uh, <coughs> the doctors told her many years ago I don't know how many years ago it was that she had the worst what you call aneurysm that you could have it was in her aorta. And that at any time, that thing could burst. And it wasn't a matter of if, but when. And they said, they told her not to ever get excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy, they ought not told her that. <laughs> I've seen her shout all over the house. Raise up her old hands toward heaven and shout. But when they said that, the church come together and we anointed her with oil and we prayed for her. Today, I've been gone from, uh, from New Haven. I've been here almost six years. Five years. <coughs> I've been gone from New Haven a long time. And this happened way back before I, when I first started pastor in New Haven. I, I'm going to say it's probably been 12 years ago that they told her that. Sister Adeline's still living today. Amen. And I'm telling you, and, and if I know her, and I do, she's still shouting the praise of God. She don't have to be in church to do it neither, brother. She can get happy right there in the house and lift them little old hands toward heaven and go to shout. I guess that's what they call getting excited. <laughs> She's supposed to avoid all that. Almost 20 years ago, when I had this heart attack, the doctor told me, you got to slow down. You can't get up there and preach and get excited like you do. Because you could have a heart attack and take you out. I said, well, if it does, that's how God, God's ready for me to go. But I'm going to preach till God calls Amen. me home. Amen. I still get excited occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't gone yet. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I've seen the works of God. And I know what God can do. Amen. What a wonderful God he is. One more point and I'll let you go. We need to teach our children 
to set their hope in God. Mm. Amen. We're living in a society today that has their hope in everything except who they ought to have it in. Oh, I hope that Social Security don't run out. <laughs> I hope that my retirement, I don't lose it. I hope, I hope, I hope. <coughs> Have you ever thought if you quit worrying about it, let God take care of it, it'd be all right? Amen. That's hard to put your hope in God the things that go on around you every day. But I'm telling you, he's the one you put your hope in. You can set your hope in God. Now, not just in this life, but in the world to come. You see, I don't worry. Uh, and and uh, used to, I worried about dying all the time. It just... It drove me crazy. My dad died uh, uh, at an early age of uh, uh, prostate cancer. And I thought, well, it runs in my family. I had an uncle died with a massive heart attack. None of my father, my father was the old lived to be the uh, oldest of all of them, I believe, I'm correct. And dad died at 69. Uncle Jim may have lived a little, I don't know. But anyway, all of them except Daddy and Uncle Jim died in their early 40s. Mm -hmm. Uncle Earl died in his 30s. And I thought, well, you know, I, 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 there's no way I'm going to live very long, you know. And I worried about that. I worried about that heart condition. I worried about cancer. I worried about all of these things. Then one night, I was praying. And God just spoke to me and said, if you'd worry as much about them as dying and going to hell as you do all these other things around you, everything would be all right. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We worry about the wrong things. We need to worry about our children that are dying and going to hell. Right, right. That's what we need to worry about. But we need to teach them that there's hope. There's hope beyond this life. There's one that's already paid the price. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now making intercessions for us. And we can go to heaven. To a place where there is no sorrow, <coughs> no, sorrow no pain, no suffering. All them things done away with. And we need to teach our children. that it don't just stop here. This is just a dressing room. It's just a place to get ready to go to meet God. There's hope, young folks. There's hope of a resurrection. And I'm glad, thank God, I have that hope. Amen. I have that assurance. And if you don't have it, you can have it today. Right. All you've got to do is trust Jesus to save but parents, we need to teach our children that they have hope. They have hope. Instead of living in a world where it looks like there is no hope, they have hope and a Savior that will let us live. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had with our folk this morning. Father, I ask that you bless this message. Father, though it be short and scattered, I pray, God, that you just take it that you'd apply to the hearts. Father, our children, our young folks, God, would you help them to understand that it's their responsibility to teach these things to their children. <coughs> oh, God, thank you for parents that loved you enough to instill in me that there is hope that I don't have to depend 
on the things of this world to get me through. But there's one that loves me enough that will help me get through. And there's one that has the strength to get me through the weak times in my life. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. In Jesus' name.